Thank you all for logging in. Um, as he said, I'm Andrew Gamler, and I will be presenting on lateral load analysis considering soil structure interaction. Start off here with an, uh, an overview. Um, so, first thing we'll be looking at is an introduction, kind of what this topic is about and why we're discussing it. Um, then I'll discuss three methods that are commonly used to account for soil structure interaction uh, for static loads. That is depth or fixity, elastic springs at the column base, and including column and case on the soil springs within the finite element model. I'll go into more detail about integrating soil springs within the finite element model <coughs> um, using Midas Civil, and then I'll jump into a case study, which will be a three-span reinforced concrete flume. So in designing structure, um, the interaction of the structure with the soil is obviously an important consideration. Pretty much everything we design is going to be founded on some type of soil, and it's important to um, realize the interaction between the structure and that soil. Right? So in many cases, the absolute and relative stiffness of the soil can have a significant impact on the forces experienced by the substructure elements, and the um, relative stiffness of the soil from one substructure element to another is also important since it influences where the location of um, the point of zero thermal movement is. Um, so in general, the point of zero thermal movement moves towards stiffer elements. So that's going to be your shorter piers, or um, if your piers are about the same height, then your soil stiffness is going to have a significant impact on where that um, the center thermal movement lies. The location of the point of zero thermal movement is important in determining the uh, movement at each substructure element. Um, obviously, we want to know that. Um, at the ends of the bridge, where we have our expansion joints, we need to have a feel for what kind of expansion and contraction we should expect. Um, also, for our piers and abutments, we're going to have loads induced, um, assuming that we're you know, fixed along the length of, length of the structure, the uh, piers and abutments are going to experience a force as they are asked to move. So they have some stiffness, so any movement is going to um, induce a force within the substructure elements. So three common methods for um, dealing with static soil structure interaction are to use the depth of fixity, elastic springs at the column base, and the soil springs within a finite element model. So I'm going to go uh, briefly through all three of these and then go into a little more detail about implementing soil springs within your model. So first one I'll discuss is the depth of fixity. Um, the effect of the soil can be approximated by including some portion of the caisson um, with hopes of kind of mirroring the actual behavior of the substructure element within the soil. There's a couple ways that we can um, approximate what that depth of fixity is. The first that I'll discuss is to determine it analytically. Um, one way of doing this is to determine the length of caisson that's required to cause the pile head translation and rotation to equal that given by an analysis of the pile's interaction with the soil. So compare what you're, I guess compare what's going on in your finite element model with what you're doing in L-pile. Complete convergence of both terms may not be possible, uh, so a comp, uh, you may need to compromise. Um, since we are approximating the caisson or pile as a fixed element, um, the shape of that is not going to take the same shape as your substructure element within the soil, and therefore you're not necessarily going to find a single length that's going to allow you to match um, within a tight, um, tight convergence um, for both your lateral translation and rotation. So um, you can compromise, say it's good enough if you're within 5 or 10% for both parameters. Um, kind of an even greater simplification from there is to use uh, an empirically based equation 
Um, AFSTA provides equations in the commentary of Chapter 7, uh, Section 7.3.13.4-1 and 2. One of those is for clay soils, one for sandy soils. Um, but that is definitely a very approximate depth of fixity. Um, that's only taking into account kind of one soil property over the entire depth of um, what you're using as a depth of fixity. Uh, there's really no um, accommodation in there for putting in different soil layers. Um, and, but it is a good starting place. So a couple advantages to using the depth of fixity is it's rel relatively simple to implement. Um, you're just basically calling your um, your uh, column and caisson system to uh, you're approximating it as a fixed cantilever. You can obtain reasonably accurate structural behavior so long as you can get good agreement between what your finite element model is doing with the depth of fixity and what your uh, more soil analysis type program such as Alpile is doing. <coughs> a few disadvantages. Uh, you do need to go through iterations um, in order to obtain a reasonable depth of fixity. Convergence can only reliably be attained for one parameter at a time. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, um, you would need if you wanted to match perfectly, you would need a different depth of fixity for translation in both the longitudinal and transverse direction and their associated rotations as well. Um, another disadvantage is you're really not getting any useful information about the case on itself and the loads that it's experiencing. You're calling it a uh, fixed cantilever, so your maximum moment and shear is going to occur at the bottom of what you're calling your depth of fixity, um, which is not a whole lot like what the uh, reality is. So kind of throw out those results once you get below the bottom of the uh, column. Uh, and then you would go into L-pile or something similar to determine what your forces are within the substructure element. Another method is to use elastic springs at the column base. Um, so you can apply these uh, springs, you can specify the spring stiffness for each relevant degree of freedom. So in general that's going to be your longitudinal and transverse translation and rotations. So you got um, kind of four values there that are I guess most meaningful in your lateral analysis. Um, this analysis can be an improvement over analysis using depth of fixity because the stiffness of the spring can be specified separately for each degree of freedom. So you can achieve um, convergence between your kind of L-pile results and your finite element model um, just by tinkering with each of those values um, independently. This method also requires iteration uh, since the translation and rotation is not necessarily linear with respect to the lateral load. A couple advantages, uh, you may get a more realistic model using this than if you were just to use the depth of fixity. And the spring stiffnesses can be specified for each degree of freedom. A couple disadvantages are that iteration is required between your finite element model and the soil structure analysis software and no information is available concerning the shear and moment within the pile or caisson. So just like when we're using the, um, the other method, the depth of fixity, um, we are not obtaining any useful information about the substructure element itself, or the uh, deep foundation element itself, the pile or the caisson. So now a little description of uh, soil springs within a finite element model. Uh, to avoid the iteration involved with the other two methods, soil springs can be integrated directly into the finite element model. Um, you can use either elastic um, springs or nonlinear springs, I guess multilinear springs in um, Midas Civil. Um, and those you would be getting from your geotech, or you could start off and get the required parameters from Lpile. Midas Civil makes this simple. Um, using the surface spring feature, 
requires only the soil subgrade modulus if you're going to go the elastic spring route. Using this method, the entire pile and caisson length can be entered along with corresponding surface springs representing the soil. Um, one advantage here is that you get the shear and moment along the pile or caisson um, directly from your finite element model. So we are getting useful information about that deep foundation element. And the structural behavior, including soil structure interaction, is fully considered. Um, you need to ensure that an adequate number of elements are implemented to ensure that your peak shear and moment are captured. Um, you can have a relatively high shear and moment uh, gradient, especially near the top of the pile. Um, and in order to capture your maximum value, you need to make sure that you have an adequate number of elements in that area. So a couple advantages. Um, no iteration is uh, required, um, especially if you're just taking values that the geotech gives you and use those as your your modulus of subgrade reaction. Um, that's going to be a constant, and you can use that uh, throughout your model. <clears throat> the case on shear and moment can be obtained directly from your finite element model, and the accuracy of the structural model um, can be at least as good as with the other two options. A couple disadvantages. Um, it may require somewhat more work to develop the model, especially if you um, feel like you need a little more accuracy and you go into um, you know, developing uh, multilinear springs for your soil springs. Uh, it's going to take a little more work to determine those and to enter them into the system. Um, and you need to know the modulus of subgrade reaction for the various soil strata. Um, so that's something, again, you would either ask your geotech to give you um, representative values for that, or you can use the soil profile that's given and obtain your um, subgrade reaction from a program such as Alpile. Um, in Midas Civil, in particular, um, when you're utilizing soil springs, the structural model is created, um, either the substructure of interest, or you can even throw your entire structure um, as a single model, um, including the deep foundation. The boundary conditions for lateral loading are then created using the surface spring option under boundaries. I'll just point that out real quick on the next slide. <clears throat> and within the surface spring dialog box, the type of element upon which the soil spring is to be applied can be chosen along with the type of spring desired. So you can have a surface spring or a point spring. You can have um, linear elastic, compression only, tension only, or you can um, define a multilinear type spring. <clears throat> the required parameters can then be entered, including the modulus of subgrade reaction. So just real quick, um, here's, you know, if you have MIDAS and use it, um, you would be under the boundary tab and just under surface spring is where we find these options. And I'll um, bring this up in a minute when we're doing the uh, case study. <clears throat> Once the model and boundary conditions have been entered, the loading can be applied and results obtained. So some of the results you may be interested in are the point of zero thermal movement and the moments along the columns and your deep foundation elements. All these can be pulled out directly for your various load cases. You can create load combinations within the program and it'll spit out your, your factored loads for you. Uh, just real quick, um, before I used the results directly from Midas Civil, I verified the accuracy of the calculations it was doing. So using elastic um, let's see, elastic static collateral subgrade modulus values given in the geotechnical report. Um, I entered those into Alpile, um, specifying a um, linear elastic um, type input, and did the thing that this, I'm sorry, the same thing within the finite element model in Midas Civil, and below shows. Um, shows how those compare, which if you take a look at it and they match uh, quite well. So now I'll discuss um, what I'm going to show you in the case study. So I have a simple uh, case study. Uh, figure that would be appropriate for this um, 
um, for this type of presentation, uh, just so it can kind of show um, a little more detail the aspect that I'm focusing on. So have a flume just shy of 200 feet. It's a um, three-span structure, three main spans, with seven-foot cantilevers on each end. The span lengths, the uh, major span lengths are 61 feet, 65 foot two, that might be a typo, um, 60 and 61 foot. Um, and these span lengths were chosen to work around existing drilled shafts. They're not necessarily ideal, um, but it's um, what we can make work. <clears throat> the superstructure is an eight foot deep reinforced concrete tub girder. The piers were designed such that most of the superstructure loads were applied directly to the columns. So the columns were placed directly below the webs of the, um, the superstructure element. You have 42 inch diameter columns, um, four foot diameter caissons, and a variable soil profile is considered. Um, simplified it a little bit for this presentation. And lateral loads were applied as per AFSTO LRFD specifications. Um, I think in this case study, I'm really only showing dead wind and thermal, just to um, just to show a couple loads within the model. So here's what we have. Um, this shows our overall length, our span lengths. I think I had a typo on that prior slide. Just calling it 65 foot something instead of 63 foot eight. Um, then we have our seven foot overhangs, and this is the cross section of the superstructure element. So here we uh, are carrying water through this thing. Uh, it's uh, 17 feet wide and seven foot tall. <coughs> and we have these wings up the top, partly to um, you know resist the negative moments since this is a continuous structure. And um, those flanges also double as a walkway for maintenance workers uh, along this ditch. All right, so now I'll jump out of my PowerPoint and get going on the case study. So <clears throat> here I'm just going to kind of build it from scratch. Towards the end, I'm going to um, skip a little bit of stuff just for the sake of time. And, um, and um, well, here we go. So first thing I do um, when I get going in one of these models is I create my properties. I have five KSI concrete for the superstructure and for the columns and uh, piers and all that. I also have four KSI concrete for the caisson. We also have our section properties. So I'm going to have user defined solid round. I'm going to call this my column with a diameter of three and a half feet. I'm also going to define my caisson section property as a solid round shape with a four foot diameter. I'm going to have the pile cap, which is simply a rectangular cross section, solid rectangle with a height of two feet and a width of four feet. And the superstructure is not something that's readily defined in here. It's kind of a unique shape, um, at least relative to what's um, commonly used in a bridge. So I'm going to define that shape using coordinates. Uh, so first we'll call it the flume Superstructure. All right, so we just have our first point. I'm going to use relative coordinates to simplify things a bit. What's going on? So starting at zero, and then we're going to move three feet to the right, seven foot down, 17 feet to the right, seven feet up three feet to the right, a foot down, two feet to the left, seven feet, oops, seven feet down, 19 feet to the left, seven feet up, and two feet to the left. 
So that is the cross section that was used for this um, superstructure. So we're holding the water here in the middle, and this is our, you know, our structural shape. I need a couple other things defined um, before the program kind of lets us use it. So T1 is the thickness of kind of our top flange. That's a foot. Thickness of our bottom flange, T2, is a foot. Uh, B sub T, center to web to center web, is 18 feet. HT from center of bottom uh, flange, center of top of flange, is 7 feet. Thickness for torsion is a foot. I'm going to let the program auto-calculate Q sub Y um, and define my Z1 and Z3 positions. So just at the bottom and top of the cross-section. So just above the bottom and just below the top. And now we have a defined cross-section. We can display the centroid and where our uh, four extreme points are. Uh, in here, we can take a look at our properties that were calculated based on the coordinates that were entered into the program um, just a minute ago. We find that the distance from the centroid of this shape to the bottom of the shape is the z value of 3 and 4. So z4 is minus 2.77. Z3 minus 2.77. So we're 2.77 feet from the bottom of the bottom flange to the centroid of this shape. All right, so now we have all of our definitions done. So we can start throwing some nodes in. So we're going to create a node. Um, the first pier is at 7 feet. The um, columns are 18 feet apart, so 9 feet in each direction. We're going to center this bridge at um, a value of y equals 0. So we have that. We can do the same thing for the bottom of the other column. Now we can copy these nodes. Um, uh, 16 feet vertically. So that's from the bottom of the column to the center of the pier cap. So we apply that. Um, we also want to de uh, define the extreme points of the pier cap itself. So we're going to go two and a half feet from the center of the column. So since it's a, um, I guess it's just shy of a four-foot diameter column, we have some extra room um, there. We have some overhang of this um, of this pier cap. All right, going to do the same thing on the other side, two and a half feet, and we're going to put a node out in the center. So we're going to go minus nine. So this node in the center is in place for the superstructure. That's where we're going to tie the superstructure in to the substructure. Um, you know, this is just a kind of a stick model uh, in terms of the superstructure. So uh, we're going to have to use a uh, some boundary condition to tie that girder to the substructure elements. All right, so now we can create some elements. We can create our column using 5 KSI concrete here and here. We can also define our, if that meant to be pier cap rather than pile cap, but I'm sure you'll forgive me. All right, so now we have um, one of our piers, sans the uh, caissons, put together. Um, those elements are a little ridiculous. You wouldn't just have one element from top to bottom of the case on, or column rather. So we will divide those up. Um, let's see. Take a look at my notes. Divide the column. Um, I'm attempting to keep element size pretty close to consistent throughout the entire model. So we're going to split that up into four pieces. 
We're going to split each of these segments of the peer cap into three segments. All right, so now it looks like something we could use. Um, so we can go ahead and copy that. Uh, we're going to translate the elements so that will bring the um, members or the members and the nodes together. We're going to copy that uh, 61 feet. I'm going to grab the most recently created items using this button here and then uh, copy again. Uh, where we go? 63 and 8 inches. And our final peer will be 61 feet from peer 3. So here's what we have so far. Um, at this point, we can create some structure groups. Um, I won't quite give you those out yet because I want to include the caissons in that. But we can create them. So we have peer 1, add peer 2, 3, or and super structure. <clears throat> All right. So All right. So now we can go ahead and start putting in our substructure. Um, so we have the nodes at the bottom of each of our columns. Here, let's do this. Rotate things a little bit so I can grab things easier. Um, so I'm going to copy using the translate function. I'm going to copy those nodes down 10.2 feet. So that's the bottom of the first soil strata. So from 0 to 10.2 uh, 10 feet um, we have approximately the same soil. We're going to go down another 14 feet for the next soil strata. Eight feet for the next. And 11.8 for the final. All right, so there are our nodes. Now we can create our caissons. Uh, let's see, node element, create elements. We're going to use the lower quality or the lower strength concrete uh, for the caissons and our caisson cross section. Define it as such. Again, we are going to need to split these up and then we can implement the soil springs. Um, just while I'm thinking about it, we're going to throw in a vertical rigid support at the bottom of these caissons. Um, that's kind of useful to have just as rigid support because that's the reaction that you're kind of looking for when you want to uh, design your caisson for the geotechnical capacity. All right, so throw those in. Now we're going to split up these caissons using the element divide. I'm going to divide the top soil strata into four segments. The next into five. Next into three and the bottom soil strata into four segments. So the reason for breaking that up uh, differently for each one is just there's a different length and I'm trying to keep um, a fairly consistent um, element length as I um, go down the length of the caisson. All right, so now at this point we can get into kind of what you're here for, right? The soil structure interaction um, portion of this model. So 
we're going to grab those elements from node 1 to node 69 to, to node 70 um, and put in our surface spring. Um, you can define boundary groups um, that can become helpful as you're trying to sort things out later. I'm going to skip that in this case. You can either convert your uh, surface spring to a nodal spring or you can use a distributed spring. So <clears throat> when you're using a nodal spring you can either use a point spring or an elastic link. I'm going to go with the point spring. The element type to which we're applying these springs is a frame rather than you know, some sort of plate or some sort of solid element. So we'll select frame and the width of our caisson is 4 feet. Uh, within uh, this type we have a choice of linear, compression only, or tension only elements. Um, I'm just choosing linear because we're going to have soil on both sides of this thing. So if it tries to go one way, it's going to be resisted by the soil uh, on that, you know, on the resisting side. If it's trying to go the other direction, there's still soil on that side as well. So um, we're, we'll call that good enough. Um, at this point, we will change our units to pounds and inches. Um, that's just going to make it easier for me to enter the uh, modulus of subgrade reaction because this is the form in which it was given. So for the top soil strata, we have 500 PCI. So enter that. Now we have some soil springs. Our next soil strata has a K of 100. Next one beyond that is 500, 500, and 500 uh, for both directions. And the bottom soil strata is 2,000 pounds per cubic inch. All right, so now we have the soil springs entered appropriately um, using an elastic type soil spring. <clears throat> um, and just kind of a side note, as I was looking through here, I could tell where the boundaries were uh, between the soil strata uh, just by looking at the node numbers. So you know, one and two are obviously different from everything else in here. But then we come down, uh, 69 is a decent jump from 77 because these elements were created after um, this was. So, you know, I'm able to tell at this level that's where one of the soil strata is. Um, then it can come from here, from node 70, We're looking for node 71. So that's the bottom of the next layer. So, you know, nothing too crazy there, but just something to uh, make it a little easier getting through that. I will now do the same thing at Pier 2. I've uh, ended up using the same soil profile, but it goes deeper because we have higher loads on the interior two piers. So uh, let's see. Come back out here, copy. We'll get back into feet. All right. So I'm going to copy those nodes down 10.2 feet. Next layer is 14 feet thick. Uh, where do we go? Next layer is 8 feet. Next layer is 11.8. Oops. 11.8. And next layer is and finally 13 is the final uh, layer we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're looking at a 62 foot um, case on depth so that matches with what's expected so I guess I entered it right. 
<coughs> um, so let's see, at this point I'll go ahead and just define the nodes for the other caissons as well. Um, the soil profile was different as we got out towards Pier 3 here. So that will be entered differently. So we have 9.5 feet for the top layer. 27 feet for the next layer. Seven point five feet for that layer. Five feet and twelve feet. And finally we come along here to pier four. <coughs> Different yet again. So fourteen point one feet from the top of the case on down to the extents of the first soil layer, and then 8.9 from there, 11.8 from there, and 9.2 from there. Cool. So we have our nodes. Now we can go ahead and throw the caissons in. Create element. Left off. Uh, I guess it's stayed where we left off. Create, uh, I guess, 4K site concrete with the caisson cross section. All right. So those are all created. Um, now we're going to split it up like we did last time and apply the soil springs. So I'm going to divide the element. Four divisions for the top layer, five for the next layer, three for the next, four for this layer, two for this little small layer, and four for the bottom layer. Again, we're going to come out to boundary. Uh, let's see. We need to make sure that we have some vertical support in here. So we're going to put those rigid supports in on the bottom nodes at piers two, three, and four, as we did at pier one. And now we're going to go to our surface spring. Make sure our settings are where they need to be. Gonna make sure we're applying it to a frame with a width of four feet using linear elements or linear springs rather. And I need to change my units. So now we can come in here and define our soil. Next layer is 100 PCI for that elastic um, modulus of subgrade reaction. Uh, 105, here we go. Next layer is stiffer, it's got 500 pounds per cubic inch. Six, seven. Next layer is quite a bit stiffer. Have 2,000 PCF. Little short layer here is relatively uh, flexible, I guess. Um, have 225 PCI, and the bottom layer we're back to 2,000 PCI. Okay. Well, at this point, I'll fast forward a little bit. Um, you've seen it done a couple of times. Um, so, you know, I would split up these large elements into similarly sized smaller elements. Um, the smaller you make your elements, the more, I guess, precise your numbers are going to come out. You're going to be able to more closely hit the maximum values um, for sheer and moment within the caisson. Um, 
but it uh, ends up, I guess, in this type of model where there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, Runtime is not a very big issue, but you know, if you had a very large model, um, like if you decide to um, model superstructure using plate elements or something, um, it may take <coughs> a fair amount of time just the more elements you're adding. So it's always a trade-off um, as to what your element size are. I think I'm using two or three feet um, per element through here. All right, so like I said, I'll fast forward and skip to a model that has the caissons and the um, boundary conditions entered already. Uh, just make sure I'm looking at what I think I am. Take a look at the supports. Those are in there. Take a look at the surface springs. Oh, I'm sorry, the, let's see, point springs. And those are all in place. All right. So at this point, we have our entire substructures defined. <coughs> so that includes the, the uh, pier caps, columns, and caissons. So let's clear those so they're not kind of in our way. Uh, what we do need is our superstructure. So we found that we were 2.77 feet um, from the uh, calculations that the program did based on the superstructure, the uh, cross-section that I entered. So we're going to be at an elevation of whatever this is. I think it's 16 feet um, plus a foot to get to the top of this plus 2.77 feet. That'll have the bottom of the superstructure sitting right on top of the uh, pier cap here. So we can create some nodes. Uh, we'll create the first one at the near end of the bridge as we're looking at it here. So 0 is going to be centered, so y is equal to 0, and z is equal to uh, 19.77, I do believe. All right, 19.77. To see that element, we've got to rotate things a little bit. We'll grab that and copy it seven feet ahead. We'll grab the one we just created, copy it 61 feet ahead. And we're just going to try to hit uh, we're going to hit the just uh, uh, above the center of each of these piers. So next one is 63.66 feet, uh, zero, zero. Oops, got to select the node first, then we can copy it. And then we'll go 61 feet from there to get above pier 4 and another 7 feet to get to the other end of the bridge. Now we can create, uh, where am I at? We're going to create our element for the superstructure. We're going to use the 5 KSI concrete and our flume cross section from here to here. So there's that. Um, we want to connect the superstructure to the substructure. So we'll get in a view where we can see what we're doing. So a little further. All right, so here's the node for the superstructure. Here's the node for the pier cap. Um, I'm just going to put in an elastic link that's essentially um, rigid for all three um, translational degrees of freedom and free to rotate in all three degrees of freedom. So as our boundary, we're going to put in an elastic link. Just put in change our units to kips, put in a very large number here, so 100,000 kips per foot. 
to get us close enough to um, a behavior where we're fixed for translation and free to rotate. <clears throat> so we can put that boundary condition in from the superstructure to the center of the peer cap at peer 1. Again here, at peer 2, at peer 3, and at peer 4. Now we can divide up the superstructure into, um, I guess, more manageable pieces and more, um, I guess, more uh, realistic element sizes. So we're going to use about three foot long elements. Again, this is a small structure, so having a lot of elements isn't that big a deal. It's probably a little excessive having uh, 20 points on this thing, which is what I'm going to do for the longer spans, but it works. So we're going to divide these end pieces, those little seven foot cantilevers, by two, so that gives us three and a half foot long elements there. These 61 foot long spans, I'm going to divide into 20. The middle span is going to divide into 21 since it's a hair longer. All right, so there's that. <coughs> um, it's a bridge that's going to experience some loads, so um, we'll, we'll go ahead and set that up. So self-weight, I'm sorry, first we're going to make some load cases. So we'll have dead load, which is permanent. I'm going to call it DC, we're using LRFD. Um, we have, I'll put in the wind load. It's real quick and dirty like. Wind on structure. And thermal. All right, so we have our load cases created. Now we need to populate those load cases. So we can create the self-weight, putting a minus one in the z direction. That means gravity is acting um, in the negative z direction. That's typical. And make sure that we are putting that into dead loads. Done. All right, so now we can put wind load on. That is going to be under wind load, load case. Um, make sure we're using kips per foot. Um, I pre-calculated the force that's going into there as 400 pounds per foot acting transversely. Um, so that's going to act in the global y direction. Um, zero, I guess using the relative input, zero just means from where you start. One means where you're ending. All right, so rotate this a hair. Make sure we're applying it to the full length of the superstructure. So now we have a transverse wind load. Uh, we're also going to have a small or a longitudinal load of 0.096 to 96 pounds per foot. Uh, starting here to here. All right, so that's our longitudinal wind. Uh, the other thing is thermal, so temperature and pre-stress. We're going to set our system temperature to something that's not zero degrees Fahrenheit, so we'll call it, I don't know, 50. <coughs> and then um, we will apply a temperature change to the superstructure. So element temperature. It's going to start at 50. We're going to have, uh, we're going to enter a 70 degree temperature increase. So grab all of those elements and make sure we didn't grab anything else. All right, yes, so that is our superstructure. We're going to apply a final temperature of 120 degrees just to give us a 70 degree temperature swing. And those red dots indicate that's done. 
Um, so now we should be able to hit run and get some results. All right, so that just took a couple seconds. Um, we can, let's see, did I do this already? Yes. All right, um, something I did um, but didn't show is put these peers into uh, what Midas calls structure groups. When you do that, then you can isolate whatever portion of the bridge you're wanting to look at. So this is peer two. It's the case on column and peer cap for peer two. And you can activate peer three and peer four. <clears throat> we can activate the whole bridge like so. And we can deactivate the sub, uh, substructure so we can put our superstructure into its um, structure group. So that's that. So now we have that all worked out. We can take a look at our whole bridge um, and start looking at our results. We'll take a straight on view and look at our deformation under the thermal loading. So we can look at the values. Ah, darn. Okay. Um, when I was putting in my thermal loads, I accidentally put them into, uh, I guess, entered them as a wind load load case. So that's easy enough to clean up. We can just come to load tables, go to element temperatures, correct one of these to make it into the thermal load case, copy that, and paste it all the way down. All right, so now run our program again, and we can get results, deformations under thermal just do dx with values. <clears throat> so here we can see that, I guess if we get close enough we can see. All right, so we can see that our structure acted um, the way that I predicted it to, the way I expected it to, because we have a stiffer soil profile out for peers one and two than we do for peers two and three. So, um, as a result, our point of zero thermal movement is right about here. We can get a little finer by um, using inches as our unit, and we're point minus point zero zero minus point zero one one inches to the left at this node, and point zero zero one inches to the right at this node. So our point of zero thermal mo movement is right about here. You could interpolate between these two values and determine what it is more precisely if you needed to. Um, but with that knowledge, you can then determine what the distance from the point of zero thermal movement to each of your substructure elements is. Then um, I guess that's less necessary here because we have our entire superstructure in place. So we can just say that our uh, expected thermal movement is about 0.35 inches um, on this side of the bridge and about you know, just five half an inch on the other end of the bridge. And then each of these piers is moving some amount. This little conglomeration of uh, values here uh, should all be about the same. Um, and that uh, just tells you how much deflection you can expect in each of your substructure elements at the top of the element. Um, we can also take a quick look at our uh, beam forces under wind load. We'll just look at one pier and get rid of values. So let's see, maybe let's look at pier one. All 
under thermal instead. That gives us a, a better feel for um, how the program is handling the soil structure interaction. So we come in here. Um, this looks like what you should kind of expect. Um, so our moment is varying linearly from the top of the column to the bottom of the column. And then it's um, increasing a little bit as we get below ground. So we take a look at the nodes. Node 1 here is the bottom of our column. And then out here, we're getting below ground where the soil structure interaction is taking place. <coughs> so you know, it should be a familiar looking curve. Um, after running a few of these um, uh, pure designs. We can also take a look at shear. Get rid of those numbers. And similarly, it um, gives about what you would expect for that. Um, one thing that I was asked to kind of demonstrate real quick um, from the Midas folk was post-processing. So uh, let's see, we'll say peer 2, activate. <clears throat> um, what I like to do before I throw this stuff into a spreadsheet is make the node and member numbers, um, I guess, kind of meaningful. So you can hit the renumber element. You can renumber the node and element. Here, you're putting in the start node and start element numbers. And I want to renumber this caisson and column. What that's going to do is um, allow me to define uh, members 1 through whatever this one is when I go to the results tables. So here, we'll do that. Uh, two active. And we're going to do the same thing for this. Um, Let's take a look at what our maximum number was. Maximum number is 27. Uh, so we'll start at 51 at the bottom of this caisson. The uh, reason this other stuff is popping up is because those numbers are kind of being stolen from those other elements, and those other elements are being renumbered as um, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is being renumbered. So, <clears throat> all right, and then we can take a look at pure cap and renumber that. Um, let's see, we're node 77. Let's keep it under 100 when we end. So we'll go to node 81 and element 81. All right. So now that we have our nodes uh, put together in a meaningful way, we're sequential from the bottom of this case on to the top of this column. We can oops, run our model again. All right. Didn't really like it when I um, did that. Really would go through and do. Um, all of your caissons and your substructure, making all of the numbers more rational um, in that way. Um, and that would speed up the runtime because right now, you know, the number, I don't know, number 70 is sitting next to number 200. And that kind of uh, messes with your, your matrices as uh, the program runs. <coughs> All right, but as you do this, um, once we have finished um, running the program, uh, we're going to go to the results tab. We're going to go to tables, and we're going to create a table uh, that that um, I'm sorry that um, indicates what our forces are, and we can do our deflections as well along the height of the caisson and column system. Um, similarly, sort of, with the uh, pure cap, um, we're not going quite in line because we're going from 81 to node 26 and then we're sequential again. Um, but if you know that, uh, it simplifies things. 
All right. Let's let this run for a second. I'm sorry. I'm, we're um, running right to the end of our time. Um, but I promise this will be done in a second. And I can kind of show you um, how this uh, dumps into a spreadsheet. So give it another second to. Um, one thing I didn't mention much as we were going through here is that um, you can have uh, varying degrees of, uh, I guess, levels of analysis um, using Midas Civil to perform the soil structure interaction. Um, so what I'm doing is kind of uh, the simplest thing. It's assuming some elastic constant for each of our uh, soil layers and turning that into a node spring. Um, you could perform, I guess, a little more detailed analysis to determine what the nonlinear uh, behavior of the soil is and use a multilinear spring to define that. Um, and that would just kind of uh, give you better accuracy um, if that's required for your project. And um, all right, so now I can take my beam forces. I want members one, sorry, members one through 25. I'm just going to look at this one column in caisson um, in our results table. So one to 25. And what the hey, we'll just include all of them. We'll include the I node and the J node. Um, if you're looking at moments, uh, it can be helpful just to unclick um, either the I or the J node. Um, I guess we will do that. I'll, I'll just plot a uh, moment along the length of this thing. So you can include <coughs> only uh, one node per element. What that's going to do is here, we can grab that and jump into Excel. So here's our data. So this is the member load case node. Uh, this is axial. This is uh, I'm sorry. One second, please. All right. So axial force. This is shear one. Shear two, torsion, moment one, moment two. I'm just calling it one and two. Um, you know, you look through your data, you'll 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 know um, what's what. So don't need to go through too much detail there. All right. So now we have a table that gives us the act, all the forces along the length of the caisson and the column. We can come into Midas here and use our node table to determine what the depth is of each of these nodes. Oops. Darn. So from 62 up to the top is at 16 feet. So we can copy that, put that here, and then let's see, did it not renumber my nodes? Okay, yeah, looks like it did. And then Oh, but it did not renumber my elements like I meant for it to do. But, mm, all right, I'm sorry. Um, had done that, I would have, you know, elements numbers from 1 to about 25 up here. Um, node numbers from 1 to 26. <coughs> and I could use that knowledge to plot what's going on with the 
um, in the um, system. So as it is now, we'll see if it works out. So we can get our moment with respect to depth. That didn't work out. But I hope you can see what I'm saying. Um, did I do a different here? Okay. So, all right. Sorry about that. But um, if you go through that process, and I guess if you're a little more careful, um, by renumbering those nodes and elements, it makes it quite a bit simpler to do your uh, post-processing. So you can make plots, make sure everything makes sense. Um, you can grab out max and min and um, uh, all the other information that you would uh, like to have for your, uh, uh, within your, I, I'm sorry, uh, to use your, your data. So, at that point, that just about concludes everything that I was going to show y'all. Um,